History of Laos, evidence for modern human presence in the northern and central highlands of Indochina, that constitute the territories of the modern Laotian nation-state dates back to the Lower Paleolithic. These earliest human migrants are Australo-Melanesians, associated with the Hovinian culture and have populated the highlands and the interior, less accessible regions of Laos and all of Southeast Asia to this day. The subsequent Austroasiatic and Austronesian marine migration waves affected landlocked Laos only marginally and direct Chinese and Indian cultural contact had a greater impact on the country. Thai and Lao people southward migration into Laos only occurred after the 8th century of the Common Era. The modern nation-state Laos emerged from the French colonial empire as an independent country in 1953. Laos exists in truncated form from the 13th century Lao Kingdom of Lanshang. Lanchang existed as a unified kingdom from 1357 to 1707, divided into the three rival kingdoms of Luang Prabang, Vientiane, and Champasak from 1707 to 1779, fell to Siamese suzerainty from 1779 to 1893, and was reunified under the French protectorate of Laos in 1893. The borders of the modern state of Laos were established by the French colonial government in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Archaeological exploration in Laos has been limited due to rugged and remote topography, a history of 20th century conflicts which have left over 2 million tons of unexploded ordnance throughout the country, and local sensitivities to history which involve the communist government of Laos, village authorities and rural poverty. The first archaeological explorations of Laos began with French explorers acting under the auspices of the École Française d'Extreme Orient. However, Due to the Lao Civil War it is only since the 1990s that serious archaeological efforts have begun in Laos. Since 2005, one such effort, the Middle Mekong Archaeological Project, MMAP, has excavated and surveyed numerous sites along the Mekong and its tributaries around Luang Prabang in northern Laos, with the goal of investigating early human settlement of the valleys of the Mekong River and its tributaries. Anatomically modern human hunter-gatherer migration into Southeast Asia before 50,000 years ago has been confirmed by the fossil record of the region. These immigrants might have, to a certain extent, merged and reproduced with members of the archaic population of Homo erectus, as the 2009 fossil discoveries in the Tampaling Cave suggest. Dated to between 46,000 and 63,000 years old, it is the oldest fossil found in the region that bears modern human morphological features. Recent research also supports more accurate understanding of migration patterns of early humans, who migrated in successive waves moving west to east following the coastlines, but also used river valleys further inland and further north than previously theorized. An early tradition is discernible in the Hobinian, the name given to an industry and cultural continuity of stone tools and flake cobble artifacts that appears around 10,000 BP in caves and rock shelters first described in Hoabin. Vietnam and later also in Laos. The earliest inhabitants of Laos, Australo-Melanesians, were followed by members of the Austroasiatic language family. These earliest societies contributed to the ancestral gene pool of the upland Lao ethnicities known collectively as Lao Thiung, with the largest ethnic groups being the Kamu of northern Laos, and the Brau and Katang in the south. Subsequent Neolithic immigration waves are considered dynamic, very complex and are intensely debated. Researchers resort to linguistic terms and argumentation for group identification and classification. Wet rice and millet farming techniques were introduced from the Yangtze River Valley in southern China since around 2000 years BC hunting and gathering remained an important aspect of food provision, particularly in forested and mountainous inland areas. Earliest known copper and bronze production in Southeast Asia has been confirmed at the site of Ban Chiang in modern northeast Thailand and among the fungi and culture of northern Vietnam since around 2000 BCE. From the 8th century BCE to as late as the 2nd century CE an inland trading society emerged on the Shangkwang Plateau, around the megalithic site called the Plain of Jars. The Plain, nominated to the tentative list of UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1992 is still being cleared from unexploded ordnance since 1998. The Jars are stone sarcophagi, date from the early Iron Age, 500 BCE to 800 CE and contained evidence of human remains, burial goods and ceramics. Some sites contain more than 250 individual jars. The tallest jars are more than in height. Little is known about the culture which produced and used the jars. The jars and the existence of iron ore in the region suggest that the creators of the site engaged in profitable overland trade. 
Dynasty. The first indigenous kingdom to emerge in Indochina was referred to in Chinese histories as the Kingdom of Funan and encompassed an area of modern Cambodia, and the coasts of southern Vietnam and southern Thailand since the 1st century CE. Funan was an Indianized kingdom, that had incorporated central aspects of Indian institutions, religion, statecraft, administration, culture, epigraphy, writing and architecture and engaged in profitable Indian Ocean trade. By the 2nd century CE, Austronesian settlers had established an Indianized kingdom known as Champa along modern central Vietnam. The Cham people established the first settlements near modern Champasak in Laos. Funan expanded and incorporated the Champasak region by the 6th century CE, when it was replaced by its successor Polity Chenla. Chenla occupied large areas of modern day Laos as it accounts for the earliest kingdom on Laotian soil. The capital of early Chenla was Shrestapura, which was located in the vicinity of Champasak and the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Wat Phu. Wat Phu is a vast temple complex in southern Laos which combined natural surroundings with ornate sandstone structures, which were maintained and embellished by the Chenla peoples until 900 CE, and were subsequently rediscovered and embellished by the Khmer in the 10th century. By the 8th century CE, Chenla had divided into land Chenla located in Laos. And Water Chenla, founded by Mahendra Varman near Samber Priyakuk in Cambodia. Land Chenla was known to the Chinese as Polu or Wen Dan and dispatched a trade mission to the Tang Dynasty court in 717 CE. Water Chenla would come under repeated attack from Champa, the Madang Sea Kingdoms in Indonesia based in Java, and finally pirates. From the instability, the Khmer emerged, and under the King Jayavarman II, the Khmer Empire began to take shape in the 9th century CE. In the area which is modern northern and central Laos, and northeast Thailand the Mon people established their own kingdoms during the 8th century CE, outside the reach of the contracting Chenla kingdoms. By the 6th century in the Jalpriya River Valley, Mon peoples had coalesced to create the Dvaravati kingdoms. In the north, Harupunjaya, Lampun, emerged as a rival power to the Dvaravati. By the 8th century the Mon had pushed north to create city-states, known as Muang, in Fada 8. Northeast Thailand, Sri Gotapura, Si Kanabang, near modern the Kek, Laos, Mwang Sua, Luang Prabang, and Shentaburi, Vient Yan. In the 8th century CE, Sri Gotapura, Si Kanabang, was the strongest of these early city states, and controlled trade throughout the middle Mekong region. The city states were loosely bound politically, but were culturally similar and introduced Theravada Buddhism from Sri Lankan missionaries throughout the region. There have been many theories proposing the origin of the Thai peoples, of which the Lao are a subgroup, including an association of the Thai people with the kingdom of Nanzhao that has been proven to be invalid. The Chinese Han Dynasty chronicles of the southern military campaigns provide the first written accounts of Thai Kata as Peking peoples who inhabited the areas of modern Yunnan China and Guangxi. James R. Chamberlain, 2016, proposes that Thai Kadai, Kra Dai, Language family was formed as early as the 12th century BCE in the Middle Yangtze Basin, coinciding roughly with the establishment of the Chu fiefdom and the beginning of the Zhou dynasty. Following the southward migrations of Kra and Lai, Ray slash Li, people as from the ancient state of Chu around the 8th century BCE, the Thai people started to break away to the east coast in the present-day Zhejiang, in the 6th century BCE, forming the state of Yui. After the destruction of the state of Yue by Chu army around 333 BCE, Yue people, Bitai, began to migrate southwards along the east coast of China to what are now Guangxi, Guizhou and northern Vietnam, forming Luo Yue, central southwestern Thai, and Xiu, northern Thai. The Thai peoples, from Guangxi and northern Vietnam began moving south, and westwards in the first millennium CE, eventually spreading across the whole of mainland Southeast Asia. Based on layers of Chinese loanwords in proto-southwestern Thai and other historical evidence, Pitayawat Pitayapuran, 2014, proposes that the southwestward migration of Thai-speaking tribes from the modern Guangxi and northern Vietnam to the mainland of Southeast Asia must have taken place sometime between the 8th 10th centuries. Thai-speaking tribes migrated southwestward along the rivers and over the lower passes into Southeast Asia, perhaps prompted by the Chinese expansion and suppression. Chinese historical texts record that, in 722, 400,000 Lao rose in revolt behind a leader who declared himself the king of Nanyue in Guangdong. After the 722 revolt, some 60,000 were beheaded. In 726, after the suppression of a rebellion by a Lao leader in the present day Guangxi, over 30,000 rebels were captured and beheaded. 
In 756, another revolt attracted 200,000 followers and lasted four years. In the 860s, many local people in what is now North Vietnam sided with attackers from Nanchao, and in the aftermath some 30,000 of them were beheaded. In the 1040s, a powerful matriarch shamaness by the name of A Nong, her chiefly husband, and their son, Nung Ji Gao, raised a revolt, took Nan Ning, besieged Guangzhou for 57 days, and slew the commanders of five Chinese armies sent against them before they were defeated, and many of their leaders were killed. As a result of these three bloody centuries, the Thai began to migrate southwestward. A 2016 mitochondrial genome mapping of Thai and Lao populations supports the idea that both ethnicities originate from the Thai Kadai TK, language family. The Thai, from their new home in Southeast Asia, were influenced by the Khmer and the Mon and most importantly Buddhist India. The Thai Kingdom of Lana was founded in 1259, in the north of modern Thailand. The Tsukotai Kingdom was founded in 1279, in modern Thailand, and expanded eastward to take the city of Shantaburi and renamed it to Vieng Chan Vieng Kham, modern Vientiane, and northward to the city of Muang Sua which was taken in 1271 and renamed the city to Shangdong Sheng Thong or city of flame trees beside the river Dong, modern Luang Prabang, Laos. The Thai peoples had firmly established control in areas to the northeast of the declining Khmer Empire. Following the death of the Tsukotai king Ram Kaman, and internal disputes within the kingdom of Lana, both Vieng Chan Vieng Kham, Vien Tian, and Sheng Dong Sheng Thong, Luang Prabang, were independent city-states until the founding of the kingdom of Lan in 1354. The Tsukotai kingdom and later the Ayutthaya kingdom were established and conquered the Khmers of the upper and central Manam Valley and greatly extended their territory. The history of the Thai migrations into Laos were preserved in myth and legends. The Nathan Kun Boromor story of Kun Borom recalls the origin myths of the Lao, and follows the exploits of his seven sons to found the Thai kingdoms of Southeast Asia. The myths also recorded the laws of Kun Borom, which set the basis of common law and identity among the Lao. Among the Kamu the exploits of their folk hero Tao Hung are recounted in the Tao Hung Tao Chuang epic, which dramatizes the struggles of the indigenous peoples with the influx of Thai during the migration period. In later centuries the Lao themselves would preserve the legend in written form, becoming one of the great literary treasures of Laos and one of the few depictions of life in Southeast Asia prior to Theravada Buddhism and Thai cultural influence. Lanshang, 1353-1707, was one of the largest kingdoms in Southeast Asia. Also known as the Land of a Million Elephants under the White Parasol the kingdom's name alludes to the power of the kingship and formidable war machine of the early kingdom. The founding of Lanshang was recorded in 1353, after a series of conquests by Fongham. From 1353 to 1560 the capital of Lanshang was Luang Prabang, known alternately as Muang Sua and Shangdong Shangthong. Under successive kings the kingdom expanded its sphere of influence over an area that now incorporates all of modern Laos, the Sipsong Chu Thai of Vietnam, Sipsong Pan of southern China, Korat Plateau region of Thailand, and the Stung Trying region of northern Cambodia. Lanchang existed as a sovereign kingdom for over 350 years. The first serious foreign invasion came from the Dai Viet in 1479, which was defeated, though leaving the capital of Luang Prabang largely destroyed. The first half of the 16th century allowed for the power, prestige and cultural influence of the kingdom to be restored under a series of strong kings, see Savanabalong, Vixun, Photosarath. In the 1540s a series of succession disputes in the neighboring kingdom of Lana, created a regional rivalry between Burma, Ayutthaya, and Lanshang. In 1540 Lanshang defeated an incursion from Ayutthaya. By 1545 the kingdom of Lana was attacked by the Burmese and then Ayutthaya. Lanshang entered into an alliance with Lana, and aided in the defense of the kingdom. In 1547 the kingdoms of Lanshang and Lana were briefly unified under Photosarath of Lanshang and his son Sethatharath in Lana. Sethatharath would go on to become the king of Lanshang on the death of his father, and become one of the greatest kings of Lanshang. The Burmese Tungu dynasty began a series of expansions during the late 1550s which culminated under King Bainong. Sethatharath moved the capital of Lanshang from Luang Prabang to Vientiane in 1560, to better defend against the threat of Burma and to more ably administer the central and southern provinces. Bainong subjugated the kingdom of Lana and went on to destroy the kingdom and city of Ayutthaya in 1564. King Sethatharath fought two successful guerrilla campaigns against the Burmese invasions, leaving Lanshang the only independent Thai kingdom until his death in 1572, 
while on campaign against the Khmer. The Burmese succeeded with the third invasion of Lanshang around 1573, and Lanshang became a vassal state until 1591 when the son of Sethatharath, Nokio Komain, was able to successfully reassert independence. Lanshang recovered and reached the apex of its political and economic power during the 17th century under King Saurik Navangsa, who became the longest reigning of Lanshang's monarchs, 1637 to 1694. In the 1640s the first European explorers to leave a detailed account of the kingdom arrived looking to establish trade and secure Christian converts, both were ultimately largely unsuccessful. Upon the death of Saurigna Vangsa a succession dispute erupted in the kingdom of Lanzang was ultimately divided into constituent kingdoms in 1707. Beginning in 1707 the Lao kingdom of Lanchang was partitioned into regional kingdoms of Vientiane, Luang Prabang and later Champasak, 1713. The kingdom of Vientiane was the strongest of the three, with Vientiane extending influence across the Korat Plateau, now part of modern Thailand and conflicting with the Kingdom of Luang Prabang for control of the Shangkwang Plateau, on the border of modern Vietnam. The Kingdom of Luang Prabang was the first of the regional kingdoms to emerge in 1707, when King Shai Ong Hu of Lanshang was challenged by King Karat, the grandson of Saurik Navangsa. Shai Ong Hu and his family had sought asylum in Vietnam when they were exiled during the reign of Saurik Navangsa. Shai Ong Hu gained the support of the Vietnamese Emperor Le Duy He up in exchange for recognition of Vietnamese suzerainty over Lan Chang. At the head of the Vietnamese army, Shai Ong Hu attacked Vien Tian and executed King Nan Harad, another claimant to the throne. In response, Saurik Navangsa's grandson King Kirat rebelled and moved with his own army from the Sipsong Pana toward Luang Prabang. King Kirat then moved south to challenge Shai Ong Hu in Vien Tian. Shiong Hu then turned toward the kingdom of Ayutthaya for support, and an army was dispatched which rather than supporting Shiong Hu arbitrated the division between Luang Prabang and Vien Yan. In 1713, the southern Lao nobility continued the rebellion against Shiong Hu under Nokasad, a nephew of Saurik Navangsa, and the kingdom of Champasak emerged. The kingdom of Champasak comprised the area south of the Zibang River as far as Stung Trying together with the areas of the Lower Moon and Chi Rivers on the Korat Plateau. Although less populous than either Luang Prabang or Vientiane, Trumpasak occupied an important position for regional power and international trade via the Mekong River. Throughout the 1760s and 1770s the kingdoms of Siam and Burma competed against each other in a bitter armed rivalry, and sought out alliances with the Lao kingdoms to strengthen their relative positions by adding to their own forces and denying them to their enemy. As a result, the use of competing alliances would further militarize the conflict between the northerly Lao kingdoms of Luang Prabang and Vien Yan. Between the two major Lao kingdoms if an alliance with one was sought by either Burma or Siam, the other would tend to support the remaining side. The network of alliances shifted with the political and military landscape throughout the latter half of the 18th century. By 1779 General Tixon had driven the Burmese from Siam, had overrun the Lao kingdoms of Champasak and Vien Yan, and forced Luang Prabang to accept vassalage. Luang Prabang had aided Siam during the siege of Vien Yan. Traditional power relationships in Southeast Asia followed the Mandala model, warfare was waged to secure repopulation centers for corvée labor, control regional trade, and confirm religious and secular authority by controlling potent Buddhist symbols, white elephants, important stupas, temples, and Buddha images. To legitimize the Donburi dynasty, General Tixon seized the Emerald Buddha and Prabang images from Vientiane. Tixon also demanded that the ruling elites of the Lao kingdoms and their royal families pledge vassalage to Siam in order to retain their regional autonomy in accordance with the Mandala model. In the traditional Mandala model, vassal kings retained their power to raise tax, discipline their own vassals, inflict capital punishment, and appoint their own officials. Only matters of war and succession required approval from the suzerain. Vassals were also expected to provide annual tribute of gold and silver, traditionally modeled into trees, provide tax and tax in kind, raise support armies in time of war, and provide corvée labor for state projects. However, by 1782 Tixon had been deposed and Rama I was king of Siam, and began a series of reforms which fundamentally altered the traditional mandala. Many of the reforms took place to more closely administer and assimilate the Korat Plateau or Asan which was traditionally and culturally part of the Lao Kingdom's tributary networks. In 1778, only Nakhon Ratchasima was a tributary of Siam, yet by the end of the reign of Rama I Sisaket, Uban, Roi et, Yasotan, 
Khon Ken, and Kaasin paid tribute directly to Bangkok. According to Thai records, by 1826, less than 50 years, the number of towns and cities in Assan had grown from 13 to 35. Forced population transfers from Lao areas were further reinforced by corvée labor projects and increased taxes. Siam required labor to help rebuild from repeated Burmese invasions and growing sea trade. Increasing the productivity and population living on the Korat Plateau provided the labor and material access to strengthen Siam. Sirabani Asan, the last independent king of Vientiane, had died by 1780, and his sons Nanthasan, Intavong, and Anuvong had been taken to Bangkok as prisoners during the sack of Vientiane in 1779. The sons would become successive kings of Vientiane, under Siamese suzerainty, beginning with Nanthasan in 1781. Nanthasan was allowed to return to Vientiane with the Prabang, the Palladium of Lanshang. The Emerald Buddha remained in Bangkok and became an important symbol to the Lao of their captivity. One of Nanthasan's first acts was to seize Zhao Sampu, a Puan prince from Shenkwang who had entered into a tributary relationship with Vietnam, and released him only when it was agreed that Shenkwang would also acknowledge Vietnam as suzerain. In 1791, a new route that was confirmed by Rama I as king of Luang Prabang. By 1792 Nanthasan had convinced Rama I that a new route that was secretly dealing with the Burmese, and Siam allowed Nanthasan to lead an army and besiege and capture Luang Prabang. A new route that was sent to Bangkok as a prisoner, and only through diplomatic exchanges facilitated by China, was a new route that released in 1795. Soon after a new route this release it was alleged that Nanthasan had been plotting with the governor of Nakhon Phanom to rebel against Siam. Rama I ordered the immediate arrest of Nanthasan, and soon after he died in captivity. In Tavong, 1795-1804, became the next king of Vientiane, and dispatched armies to aid Siam against Burmese invasions in 1797 and 1802, and to capture the Sipsong Chatai, with his brother Anuvong as general. Anuvong is a symbolic and controversial figure even today. His short-lived rebellion against Siam from 1826 to 1829 ultimately proved futile and led to the total annihilation of Vientiane as a kingdom and a city, yet among the Lao he remains a potent symbol of unyielding defiance and national identity. Thai and Vietnamese histories record that Anu Vong rebelled as the result of personal insult suffered at the funeral of Rama II in Bangkok. Yet, the Anu Vong rebellion lasted three years and engulfed the whole of the Korat Plateau for more complex reasons. The history of forced population transfers, corvée labor projects, loss of national symbols and prestige, most notably the Emerald Buddha, formed the backdrop to specific actions taken by Rama III to directly annex the Asan region. In 1812 Siam and Vietnam were at odds over the succession of the Cambodian king, the Vietnamese gained its upper hand with their chosen successor and Siam compensated itself by annexing territory on the Dangrek Mountains and along the Mekong River in Stung Trang. As a result, Lao international trade along the Mekong was effectively blockaded, and heavy duties were imposed on Lao merchants who were viewed suspiciously by Siam for their trade with both the Cambodians and Vietnamese. In 1819 a rebellion in Champasak provided Anu Vong with opportunity, and he dispatched an army under his son Nyo who managed to suppress the conflict. In exchange Anu Vong successfully made the case that his son be crowned as king in Champasak which was confirmed by Bangkok. Anu Vong had successfully expanded his influence throughout Vientiane, Asan, Shenkwang and now Trumpasak. Anu Vong dispatched a number of diplomatic missions to Luang Prabang, which were viewed suspiciously in light of his growing regional influence. By 1825 Rama II had died, and Rama III was consolidating his position against Prince Mongkut, Rama IV. In the ensuing power struggle before the accession of Rama I one of Anu Vong's grandsons was killed. When Anu Vong arrived for the funerary services, he made several requests of the King Rama III which were dismissed including the return of his sister who had been captured in 1779, and Lao families which had been relocated to Saraburi near Bangkok. Before returning to Vientiane, Anu Vong's son Ngao, the crown prince, was forced to perform manual labor during which he was beaten. Early in his reign, Rama III ordered a census of all peoples on the Korat Plateau. The census involved the forced tattooing of each villager's census number and name of their village. The aim of the policy was to more tightly administer Lao territories from Bangkok and was facilitated by the nobility Siam had installed in the newly created cities throughout the region. Popular resentment against the forced tattooing and increased taxes became causes belly for rebellion. Toward the end of 1826 Anu Vong was making military preparations for armed rebellion. 
Anu Vong's strategy involved three objectives. First was to repatriate all ethnic Lao living in Siam to the right bank of the Mekong and execute any Siamese engaged in the tattooing of Lao. The second objective was to consolidate Lao power by forging an alliance with Chiang Mai and Luang Prabang. The third and final goal was to gain international support from either the Vietnamese, Chinese, Burmese or British. In January hostilities commenced, and the Lao armies were sent from Vientiane to capture Nakhon Ratchasima, Kalasin, and Lomsak. From Chapasak forces rushed to take Hubon and Suvanatham, while pursuing a scorched earth policy ensuring the Lao time to retreat. Anu Vong's forces pushed south eventually to Saraburi to free the Lao there, but the flood of refugees pushing north slowed the army's retreat. Anu Vong also severely underestimated the Siamese arms stockpile, which under the terms of Burney Treaty had provided Siam with weaponry from the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. A Lao defense was staged at Nong Bualampu, the traditional Lao stronghold in the Asan, but the Siamese emerged victorious and leveled the city. The Siamese pushed north to take Vietnam and Anu Vong fled southeast to the border with Vietnam. By 1828, Anu Vong had been captured, tortured, and sent to Bangkok with his family to die in a cage. Rama III ordered Zhao Bodin to return and level the city of Vietnam, and forcibly moved the entire population of the former Lao capital to the Asan region. Following the Anu Vong Rebellion Siam and Vietnam were increasingly at odds over control of the Indo-Chinese Peninsula. In 1831 Emperor Minh Mong sent Vietnamese troops to seize Shang Quang and annex the area as the province of Tran Ninh. Also in 1831 and again in 1833 King Mantha Turith sent a tributary mission to the Vietnamese, which were quietly ignored so as not to antagonize the Siamese further. In 1893 these tributary missions from Luang Prabang were used by the French as part of a legal argument for all the territories on the east bank of the Mekong. In late 1831 Siam and Vietnam had a series of wars, Siamese-Vietnamese War 1831-1834, and Siamese-Vietnamese War 1841-1845, over control of Sheng Quang and Cambodia. In the aftermath of Vientiane's destruction the Siamese divided the Lao lands into three administrative regions. In the north, the king of Luang Prabang and a small Siamese garrison controlled Luang Prabang, the Sipsong Pana, and Sipsong Chao Thai. The central region was administered from Nong Kai and extended to the borders of Tran Ninh, Xing Quang, and south to Champasak. The southern regions were controlled from Champasak and extended to areas bordering Cochin China and Cambodia. From the 1830s through the 1860s, small rebellions took place across Lao lands and the Kora Plateau but they lacked both the scale and coordination of the Anu Vong Rebellion. Importantly, at the end of each rebellion Siamese troops would return to their administrative centers, and no Lao region was allowed to have a build-up of force which could have been used in rebellion. Population transfers of ethnic Lao to Siam began in 1779 with Siamese suzerainty. Artisans and members of the court were forcibly moved to Saraburi near Bangkok, and several thousand farmers and peasants who were transported throughout Siam to Petchaburi, Rathburi, and Nakhon Chasey in the southwest and to Prakanbari on Chantaburi in the southeast. However, massive deportations estimated between 100,000 to 300,000 people began following the defeat of King Anuvang in 1828, and would continue until the 1870s. From 1828 to 1830 over 66,000 people were forcibly relocated from Vientiane. In 1834 the first of several relocations of the Puan areas off Shenguang began transferring more than 6,000 people. Most of those relocated were settled in the Asan region and were considered that Chaloi or war slaves who were to serve as serfs in underpopulated areas for the Thai elite. The result changed the demographics and cultural traditions of Thailand and Laos and continues today with a five-fold disparity between the ethnic Lao living on the west bank of the Mekong and those left in the east in what is today Laos. Although slavery existed in Lao areas before the rebellion in 1828, the defeat and subsequent removal of most ethnic Lao left a depopulated and vulnerable position for the remaining people of the east bank of the Mekong. Lao the Ung Hill tribes which had little involvement in the 1828 rebellion bore the brunt of organized slave raids into Laos and became known collectively and pejoratively in Thai and Lao as Ka or slaves. Lao the Ung were hunted or sold into slavery frequent organized raiding parties from Vietnam, Cambodia, Siam, Laos, and China. Larger tribes of Lao the Ung such as the Brow, would conduct slave raids against weaker tribes. The raids continued throughout the remainder of the 19th century. A Siamese military campaign in Laos in 1876 was described by a British observer as having been transformed into slave hunting raids on a large scale.
the population transfers and slave rates ameliorated toward the end of the 19th century when European observers and anti-slavery groups made their presence increasingly difficult for the Bangkok elite. In 1880 both slave rating and trading became illegal, although debt slavery would persist until 1905 by degree of King Jalal and Korn. The French would use the existence of slavery in Siam as one of the major professed motivations for establishing a protectorate of Laos during the 1880s and 1890s. In the 1840s sporadic rebellions, slave raids, and a movement of refugees throughout the areas that would become modern Laos left whole regions politically and militarily weak. In China the Qing dynasty was pushing south to incorporate hill peoples into the central administration, at first floods of refugees and later bands of rebels from the Taiping Rebellion pushed into Lao lands. The rebel groups became known by their banners and included a yellow, or striped, flags. Red flags and the black flags. The bandit groups rampaged throughout the countryside, with little response from Siam. During the early and mid 19th century, the first Laosung, including the Hmong, Min, Yao, and other Sino Tibetan groups, began settling in the higher elevations of Pong Sali province and northeast Laos. The influx of immigration was facilitated by the same political weakness which had given shelter to the Ha bandits and left largely populated areas throughout Laos. By the 1860s the first French explorers were pushing north charting the path of the Mekong River, with hope of a navigable waterway to southern China. Among the early French explorers was an expedition led by Francis Garnier, who was killed during an expedition by Horebels in northern Laos. The French would increasingly conduct military campaigns against the Ha in both Laos and Vietnam, Tonkin, until the 1880s. French colonial interests in Laos began with the exploratory missions of Dudart de la Grey and Francis Garnier during the 1860s in the hopes of utilizing the Mekong River as a passage to southern China. Although the Mekong is unnavigable due to a number of rapids, the hope was that the river might be tamed with the help of French engineering and a combination of railways. In 1886 Britain secured the right to appoint a representative in Chiang Mai, in northern Siam. To counter British control in Burma and growing influence in Siam. That same year France sought to establish representation in the Wang Prabang, and dispatched Togus Pavi to secure French interests. Pavi and French auxiliaries arrived in the Wang Prabang in 1887, in time to witness an attack on the Wang Prabang by Chinese and Thai bandits, hoping to liberate the brothers off their leader Dio Van Trai, who were being held prisoner by the Siamese. Pavi prevented the capture of the ailing King On Kham by ferrying him away from the burning city to safety. The incident won the gratitude of the king, provided an opportunity for France to gain control of the Sipsong Chutai as part of Tonkin in French Indochina, and demonstrated the weakness of the Siamese in Laos. In 1892 Pavey became resident minister in Bangkok, where he encouraged a French policy which first sought to deny or ignore Siamese sovereignty over Lao territories on the east bank of the Mekong, and secondly to suppress the slavery of upland Lao Thiung and population transfers of Lao Lom by the Siamese as a prelude to establishing a protectorate in Laos. Siam reacted by denying French trading interests, which by 1893 had increasingly involved military posturing and gunboat diplomacy. France and Siam would position troops to deny each other's interests, resulting in a Siamese siege of Kong Island in the south and a series of attacks on French garrisons in the north. The result was the Paknam Incident. The Franco-Siamese War and the ultimate recognition of French territorial claims in Laos. The French were aware that the East Bank territories of the Mekong were a depopulated, devastated country. The Siamese forced population transfers following the Anu Vong Rebellion left only a fifth of the original population on the East Bank. The majority of Lao Lom and Buin peoples had been resettled to the areas around the Korat Plateau. Territorial gains in 1893 were only a springboard to secure French control of the Mekong deny Siam as much territorial control as possible by acquiring Mekong's West Bank territories including the Korat Plateau, and negotiating stable borders with British Burma along the former territories which paid tribute to the Kingdom of Luang Prabang. France settled a treaty with China in 1895, gaining control of Luang Namtha and Pong Sali. British control of the Shan states and French control of the Upper Mekong increased tensions between the colonial rivals. A joint commission completed its work in 1896 and the city of Muang Singh was gained by France, in exchange France recognized Siamese sovereignty over the areas of the Khao Phraya River Basin. However, the issue of Siamese control over the Korat Plateau, which was ethnically and historically Lao, 
was left open for the French as was Siamese control over the Malay Peninsula which favored British interests. Political events in Europe would shape French Indo-Chinese policy however, and between 1896 and 1904 a new political party took power which viewed Britain as much more of an ally than a colonial rival. In 1904 the Entente Cordiale was signed as part of the alliance against Germany and Austria-Hungary that fought the First World War. The agreement established respective spheres of influence in Southeast Asia, although French territorial claims would continue until 1907 in Cambodia. The French Protectorate of Laos established two and at times three administrative regions governed from Vietnam in 1893. It was not until 1899 that Laos became centrally administered by a single resident superior based in Savanakhet, and later in Vientiane. The French chose to establish Vientiane as the colonial capital for two reasons, firstly it was more centrally located between the central provinces in Luang Prabang, and secondly the French were aware of the symbolic importance of rebuilding the former capital of the Lanshang Kingdom which the Siamese had destroyed. As part of French Indochina both Laos and Cambodia were seen as a source of raw materials and labor for the more important holdings in Vietnam. French colonial presence in Laos was light, the resident superior was responsible for all colonial administration from taxation to justice and public works. The French maintained a military presence in the colonial capital under the Guard Indochine made up of Vietnamese soldiers under a French commander. In important provincial cities like Luang Prabang, Savanakhet, and Poxay there would be an assistant resident police, paymaster, postmaster, school teacher and a doctor. Vietnamese filled most upper-level and mid-level positions within the bureaucracy, with Lao being employed as junior clerks, translators, kitchen staff and general laborers. Villages remained under the traditional authority of the local headman or jamwang. Throughout the colonial administration in Laos the French presence never amounted to more than a few thousand Europeans. The French concentrated on the development of infrastructure the abolition of slavery and indentured servitude, although corvée labor was still in effect, trade including opium production, and most importantly the collection of taxes. Under the French rule, the Vietnamese were encouraged to migrate to Laos, which was seen by the French colonists as a rational solution to a practical problem within the confines of an Indochina-wide colonial space. By 1943, the Vietnamese population stood at nearly 40,000 forming the majority in the largest cities of Laos and enjoying the right to elect their own leaders. As a result, 53% of the population of Vien Yon, 85% of Thak Ek and 62% of Pak Se were Vietnamese, with only an exception of Luang Phrabang where the population was predominantly Lao. As late as 1945, the French even drew up an ambitious plan to move massive Vietnamese population to three key areas, i.e. the Vien Yon Plain, Savanakhet Region, Bo Lavin Plateau which was only discarded by Japanese invasion of Indochina. Otherwise, according to Martin Stewart Fox, the Lao might well have lost control over their own country. The Lao response to French colonialism was mixed, although the French were viewed as preferable to the Siamese by the nobility, the majority of Lao Lom, Lao Thiung, and Lao Sung were burdened by regressive taxes and demands for corvée labor to establish colonial outposts. The first serious resistance to the French colonial presence began in southern Laos, as the Holy Man's Rebellion led by Ong Kao, and would last until 1910. The rebellion began in 1901 when a French commissioner in Salavan was attempting to pacify Lao Thiung tribes for taxation and corvée labor. Ong Kao provoked anti French sentiment, and in response, the French burned a local temple. The commissioner and his troops were massacred and a general uprising began throughout the Bolavan Plateau. Ong Kao would be killed by French forces, but for several years his harassment and protests gained popularity in the southern Laos. It was not until the movement spread to the Korat Plateau and threatened to become an international incident involving Siam that several French columns of the Guard Indigene converged to put down the rebellion. In the North Tailu groups from the areas around Pong Sali and Wang Seng also began to rebel against French attempts at taxation and corvée labor. In 1914 the Tailu king had fled to the Chinese portions of the Sipsong Pana, where he began a two-year guerrilla campaign against the French in northern Laos, which required three military expeditions to suppress and resulted in direct French control of Wang Seng. In northeast Laos, Chinese and Lao Thiung rebelled against French attempts to tax the opium trade which resulted in another rebellion from 1914 to 1917. By 1915 most of northeast Laos was controlled by Chinese and Lao Thiung rebels. 
The French dispatched the largest military presence yet to Laos which included 160 French officers and 2,500 Vietnamese troops divided in two columns. The French drove the Chinese-led rebels across the Chinese border and placed Pong Sali under direct colonial control. Yet northeastern Laos was still not entirely pacified and a Hmong shaman named Pa Shea Vu attempted to establish a Hmong homeland through a rebellion, pejoratively termed the Madman's War, which lasted from 1919-1921. By 1920 the majority of French Laos was at peace and colonial order had been established. In 1928 the first school for the training of Lao civil servants was established, and allowed for the upward mobility of Lao to fill positions occupied by the Vietnamese. Throughout the 1920s and 1930s France attempted to implement Western, particularly French, education, modern health care and medicine, and public works with mixed success. The budget for colonial Laos was secondary to Hanoi, and the worldwide Great Depression further restricted funds. It was also in the 1920s and 1930s that the first stirrings of Lao nationalist identity emerged due to the work of Prince Fetzerat Ratanavangsa and the French École Française d'Extreme Orient to restore ancient monuments, temples, and conduct general research into Lao history, literature, art and architecture. French interest in indigenous history served a dual purpose in Laos it reinforced the image of the colonial mission as protection against Siamese domination, and was also a legitimate route for scholarship. Developing Lao national identity gained importance in 1938 with the rise of the ultra-nationalist Prime Minister Phabun Songkrum in Bangkok. Phabun Songkrum renamed Siam to Thailand, a name change which was part of a larger political movement to unify all Thai peoples under the central Thai of Bangkok. The French viewed these developments with alarm, but the Vichy government was diverted by events in Europe and World War II. Despite a non-aggression treaty signed in June 1940, Thailand took advantage of the French position and initiated the Franco-Thai War. The war concluded unfavorably for Lao interests with the Treaty of Tokyo, and the loss of Transmigong territories of Zaniaburi and part of Champasak. The result was Lao distrust of the French and the first overtly national cultural movement in Laos, which was in the odd position of having limited French support. Charles Rochet, the French director of public education in Vientiane and Lao intellectuals led by Nui Afei and Katai Don Sa Earth began the movement for national renovation. Yet the wider impact of World War II had little effect on Laos until February 1945, when a detachment from the Japanese Imperial Army moved into Shenkwang. The Japanese preempted that the Vichy administration of French Indochina under Admiral de Coup would be replaced by a representative of the Free French loyal to Charles de Gaulle and initiated Operation Mago, Bright Moon. The Japanese succeeded in the internment of the French living in Vietnam and Cambodia, but in the remote areas of Laos the French were able with the help of the Lao and Guard Indigene to establish jungle bases which were supplied by British airdrops from Burma. However, French control in Laos had been sidelined. 1945 was a watershed year in the history of Laos. Under Japanese pressure King Sisabongbong declared independence in April. The move allowed the various independence movements in Laos including the Laos Aryan Lao Pen Lao to coalesce into the Lao Isara or Free Lao movement which was led by Prince Fetzerat and opposed the return of Laos to the French. The Japanese surrender on August 15, 1945 emboldened pro-French factions and Prince Fetzerat was dismissed by King Sisabongbong. Undeterred Prince Fetzerat staged a coup in September and placed the royal family in Luang Prabang under house arrest. On October 12, 1945, the Lao Isara government was declared under the civil administration of Prince Fetzerat. In the next six months, the French rallied against the Lao Isara and were able to reassert control over Indochina in April 1946. The Lao Isara government fled to Thailand, where they maintained opposition to the French until 1949. When the group split over questions regarding relations with the Viet Minh and the Communist Patat Lao was formed. With the Lao Isara in exile, in August 1946 France instituted a constitutional monarchy in Laos headed by King Sisavongvong, and Thailand agreed to return territory SIs during the Franco Thai War in exchange for a representation at the United Nations. The Franco Lao General Convention of 1949 provided most members of the Lao Isara with a negotiated amnesty and sought appeasement by establishing the Kingdom of Laos, a quasi independent constitutional monarchy within the French Union. In 1950, additional powers were granted to the royal Lao government, including training and assistance for a national army. On October 22, 1953, the Franco Lao Treaty of Amity and Association transferred remaining French powers to the independent royal Lao government. By 1954, the defeat at Dien Bien Phu brought eight years of fighting with the Viet Minh, during the First Indo Chinese War, to end.
to an end and France abandoned all claims to the colonies of Indochina. Elections were held in 1955, and the first coalition government, led by Prince Savonapoma, was formed in 1957. The coalition government collapsed in 1958. In 1960, Captain Kongla staged a coup when the cabinet was away at the royal capital of Luang Prabang and demanded reformation of a neutralist government. The second coalition government, once again led by Savanapoma, was not successful in holding power. Rightist forces under General Fumi No Savan drove out the neutralist government from power later that same year. The North Vietnamese invaded Laos between 1958 to 1959 to create the Ho Chi Minh Trail. A second Geneva Conference, held in 1961-62, provided for the independence and neutrality of Laos, but the agreement meant little in reality and the war soon resumed. A growing North Vietnamese military presence in the country increasingly drew Laos into the Second Indochina War, 1954-1975. As a result, for nearly a decade, eastern Laos was subjected to some of the heaviest bombing in the history of warfare as the U.S. sought to destroy the Ho Chi Minh Trail that passed through Laos and defeat the communist forces. The North Vietnamese also heavily backed the Pot at Lao and repeatedly invaded Laos. The government and army of Laos were backed by the USA during the conflict. The United States trained both regular Royal Lao forces and irregular forces among whom many were the Hmong and other ethnic minorities. Shortly after the Paris Peace Accords led to the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Vietnam, a ceasefire between the Pot at Lao and the government led to a new coalition government. However, North Vietnam never withdrew from Laos and the Pot at Lao remained little more than a proxy army for Vietnamese interests. After the fall of South Vietnam to communist forces in April 1975, the Pot at Lao with the backing of North Vietnam were able to take total power with little resistance. On December 2, 1975, the king was forced to abdicate his throne and the Lao People's Democratic Republic was established. Around 300,000 people out of a total population of 3 million left Laos by crossing the border into Thailand following the end of the civil war. The new communist government led by Khazon Phumbihan imposed centralized economic decision-making and incarcerated many members of the previous government and military in re-education camps which also included the H. Mongs. While nominally independent, the communist government was for many years effectively little more than a puppet regime run from Vietnam. The government's policies prompted about 10% of the Lao population to leave the country. Laos depended heavily on Soviet aid channeled through Vietnam up until the Soviet collapse in 1991. In the 1990s the Communist Party gave up centralized management of the economy but still has a monopoly of political power. Citations works cited. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.